Hello everyone, I'm Tim Hansen, a staff engineer on the Backstage team at Spotify. And today I'm going to talk about GitOps and how we use it at Spotify. So what is GitOps? This is my simple definition, if you haven't heard this term before. Infrastructure automation using files stored in source control. Now this might sound familiar. Wait, isn't that just infrastructure as code? And it is. GitOps is just applied infrastructure as code with a little bit more prescriptive workflow. With GitOps, you must use source control, you must use code review, you must make all changes through Git. And in addition to this prescriptive workflow, there's a few principles to follow for GitOps. First, we must be able to express the desired state declaratively. That means I can describe the infrastructure I want in a file. Second, those declarations must be versioned and immutable which helps with the third bullet, which is that changes to those declarations are applied automatically. That means something's paying attention to Git and tries to make reality match my declarations. So the Git part of GitOps already handles the first two. Since we're using Git as the source of truth, of course the declarations are clearly stored in files. And Git commits are also versioned and immutable. So that just leaves the last bullet. And that last part means that we have an agent. This is a process paying attention to Git, which can look at your declaration versus reality and then apply the necessary changes. So GitOps isn't all that complicated. We store declarations in Git. Those get reconciled with reality. This should be very familiar if you're used to tools like Terraform. So what's the benefit of embracing this approach? Let's look at a typical release to production at a software company. So developers make code changes and check them into source control. The code gets built and packaged in the CI system. If you need new infrastructure resources, maybe an ops person provisions them. If there are database schema changes, you might have a DBA that applies some migration scripts. The code's pushed into production with scripts or even manually. If there are configuration changes needed to the runtime environment, an ops person applies them. And now finally, we can start accepting traffic and do a rollout, which is either manual or somewhat automated. And finally, a DBA might apply some post-deployment database script. So this process is a bit slow and there's a few people involved and I'm even missing some steps here. There's probably release verification, some manual testing, decommissioning the previous release. If your release process looks like this, you probably don't release every day. You probably have someone clicking things late at night to avoid outages, and this just doesn't scale. So let's compare how we typically do software releases at Spotify. It starts out the same. Developers make code changes and commit them. We build and package things in CI, maybe a little bit differently. But then things start to look very different. Cloud resources are automatically synced based on declarations and code. Database changes are automatically applied based on migrations in code. New application pods and Kubernetes are created based on declarations in code. And the rollout is handled automatically based on canary configuration in code. So the release is completely automated. The only people left in this process are the developers. This allows us to continuously release thousands of microservices many times per day. So this shows a very tangible benefit of GitOps. By automating the infrastructure steps, we can scale the release process and make it faster. And because all the changes are stored in code, we have all the nice things that Git provides, like a review process, version history, permissions, and even an easy rollback mechanism. So that was a crash course in GitOps to set the stage. And now I want to show you how we use GitOps in practice at Spotify. So let's start with builds. The build system is the starting point of GitOps, and this is where the process is kicked off. We have a central build system at Spotify called Tingle. It's a custom system, but it's very similar to GitHub Actions that came out later. Most interestingly, it has a declarative pipeline language. Remember the principles of GitOps? The desired state of our build is stored declaratively, and it's stored in Git, so it's versioned and immutable. And lastly, changes must be applied automatically. So Tingle uses GitHub webhooks to trigger builds automatically. 
So this is roughly what a Tingle build pipeline looks like. We have two pipelines, a review build and a master build. We build this Java application with Maven in both cases, and the master build triggers a deployment. So if I make changes to this build file and commit it, Tingle picks up on that via GitHub webhook and changes how it builds my application. Now there's something interesting that GitOps enables here. Many of our microservices use the exact same build steps. Compile Java, deploy to Kubernetes, etc. So this build definition could get copied and repeated all over the place. But in GitOps, we have an agent watching for changes. So why don't we have that agent do a little translation for us? Instead of that big pipeline definition getting copied around, we created build templates. This tiny file on the left is what you typically see for a microservice. This template is translated by our build system into a bigger standard definition for Java backends. We have similar templates for websites, Python backends, streaming pipelines. This is another superpower of GitOps, abstraction and simplification. By using GitOps and standard tech stacks, we can make builds absolutely brainless for developers. For software that truly needs a custom build, the full pipeline language is always available, but for most of our components, the template is just fine. So next, let's talk about deployments. Like builds, we have a central system that handles most of our deployments, and again, it has a declarative language with the desired state stored in Git. The changes are applied automatically, though in this case kicked off by the build rather than directly from Git. And here again, we use a custom YAML file to define a very minimal format. We're leveraging the power of standards and defaults. All we have to say is that this is a backend service deployed with Kubernetes. For Kubernetes deployments, our deployment system looks for a root level Kubernetes folder in our source code by default. This can contain standard Kubernetes definitions like the service and the deployment, along with other custom definitions managed in Kubernetes. So here we're not only storing a declaration of how to deploy in Git, but also the declarations of what to deploy. You can see a few cloud resources we manage declaratively, such as a database and IAM users. And one more thing on deployments. This declarative format allows us to build very powerful features and make them easy to express and add to a service. As an example, our deployment system can do automated canary deployments. This means for each code change, we stand up a new pod, shadow load some traffic onto it, and check metrics like error ratio to make sure that the new pod is behaving before promoting the entire deployment. You can see how easy this is to add to your service, just a few lines of YAML. And as a result, lots of services do use it. We can even create the PR for you. Now, moving on to monitoring, Metrics are collected through uh, Kubernetes sidecars from our services and sent to a central metrics database. From there, we use Grafana to visualize these metrics and provide alerts. And we use GitOps. You might be starting to sense a theme here. We have a central system, again, with a declarative language with changes automatically applied. We use the same abstraction and simplification trick that we did with builds and deployments. Since so many of our microservices are using the same standard technology, emitting the same metrics, the same graphs are useful. So we've defined templates that are expanded into graphs covering all the standard metrics. So here on the left is a declarative monitoring file for a typical microservice. And this gets translated into JSON to create Grafana dashboards. So by using our standard backend framework and this tiny YAML file, I get a full featured dashboard for my backend service. And not only that, but alerts are already configured for metrics that are typically significant. So you can imagine the power of these templates. No one has to spend time creating dashboards or thinking about what metrics are available for their service. We can provide alerting recommendations. And if we add a new metric, we can roll it out to everyone using the template. No code change required. Something I haven't mentioned yet is how we tie all this infrastructure together. To make this all work seamlessly, we need some metadata about the service itself. 
For example, the deployment defaults to certain regional availability based on the tier of the service. Those Grafana alerts need to know who owns the service to send the alert to the right place. For this metadata, we have our software catalog. And of course, we use GitOps to manage it as well. The software catalog stores information about the service and also information about relationships this service has to other software or resources. This one, for example, declares that it depends on its database and that the API is consumed by another service. This means our catalog is not just a list of services, but a graph. This software catalog is part of Backstage, our developer portal. We released Backstage as an open source project and donated it to the CNCF four years ago, so it would always be free. And now thousands of companies are using it. So Backstage brings all this metadata together so our developers have a single pane of glass into all of our infrastructure. You can see builds, deployments, how your service ties into the software graph. Now Backstage also has software templates. These are blueprints for creating a new piece of software so that you start a new repository ready to write code instead of doing a bunch of one-time setup. For example, this Spring Boot template might have Maven already set up, a sample route defined, default server configuration. It'll probably not surprise you that these templates themselves are defined in Git using a declarative templating language. But that's not what I want to focus on here. Instead, think about all those declarative files we just talked about for builds, deployments, monitoring, software metadata. So of course, we include all these YAML files in the template as well, already customized for the kind of software you're creating. By using a software template in Backstage, filling out a few form fields, a developer at Spotify can create a service that's ready for production in just a few clicks. It can build and deploy right away. It's automatically registered in our software catalog, already has monitoring and alerting set up. They never had to touch the YAML. So I don't know about you, but this blows my mind. By having everything declarative in code and having standard technology stacks, you get infrastructure basically for free. And if you need to make modifications, it's easy. So if I've sold you on GitOps this far, you might be thinking, oh great, now I have to go work at Spotify to enjoy all this. And I do encourage that, apply today, but it's not necessary. The tools are out there for you to use GitOps at your company. There are tons of tools for running builds in a GitOps friendly way. The big version control providers are doing some nice work here. GitHub Actions, like I said, is very similar to our internal build pipelines. For provisioning cloud infrastructure with GitOps, the solution space is a little bit more limited. Terraform is the classic infrastructure as code tool that everyone thinks of, but it doesn't handle drift and reconciliation in a very automated way. Config Connector is a great tool that we use at Spotify, but it only works for Google Cloud. And Crossplane is a CNCF project that's super interesting in this space. It can serve the same function as Config Connector, but it's cloud agnostic. And lastly, there's Pulumi, which is kind of similar to Terraform, but offers libraries in many different languages instead of using Terraform's HCL. For ap application deployment, Argo CD and Flux are the two dominant tools that you'll primarily hear about. These are both focused on Kubernetes deployments. And beyond those tools, there's some great GitOps resources out there. OpenGitOps.dev is from the CNCF GitOps Working Group. GitOps.tech is a site from Weaveworks who kind of pioneered this space. And they also have an awesome list of GitOps tools, including a bunch that I didn't cover here. And so I hope you can see some of the power of GitOps and have some inspiration to start using it at your company. So thank you, everyone. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or need advice. Thank you.